That's true. And even though I guess it's eight, we're afraid, you know. It's a lot worse than other states than it is in Texas, at least now. We put our kids back in school for the first But we're not. We have not been. Kids have not been put back. They just keep. Well, where I live, I mean, in my district, we never shut down. Hey, Anna, how are you? I mean, my daughter. Hey, Ron, how are you? Hello, Rabbi. What's going on? What's this? Uh, what's this game that everybody's talking about? Uh, I think it's Mexico against Honduras in soccer. Oh, <laughs> good one! I'm I'm actually surprised that you're holding a session tonight. Why not? Torah doesn't stop. That's true. The what? Didn't help us beat her last. Well, it didn't help us beat the uh, the the Braves, but hopefully, hopefully tonight it will. Hashem did sees get, it. Did What's you that? Get a good, did you get a good turnout there at the Torch Center? Uh, yes, we have a fantastic turnout. Don't tell anybody, but two of the most important people in the Greater Houston area are right here in the room. Who are they? Uh, it's a whole device to turn it around to show you, but it's Wendy and Ed. Say hello, everybody. Yeah, everyone hears you. You're loud. Hello. Hi, Pascal. How are you? Good. Thank you. Bye bye. Como ça va? Ça va bien. Merci. Yeah, très bien. Hi, Aliza. How are you? Oh. Aliza, how are you? We see you. Oh, we don't hear you now. You are mute. Oh, is that good? There you go. Now we oh, hear you. Okay. I accidentally had the volume off. <laughs> no problem. How are you? Thank God. Fantastic. Great. All right, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi I'm, I'm at What's the Jewish home. I'm at the Jewish homeland. Oh, is that Sugarland? No, Miami. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh -huh. You have a home in Miami? In uh, Delray Beach. Oh, very nice. I didn't know that. Okay. So I spent many hours today uh, downtown, downtown Houston. Um, some of you may not know this, but aside for the, the uh, conference that the, the uh, World Series going on, there is actually a, a, con a nationwide conference that's here for old age homes and nursing home uh, administrators and uh, assisted living facilities, etc. So that's a very Jewish business. Um, and uh, there are about 250 Shomer Shabbos Jews downtown today. Um, so they had, the they had the minion morning, afternoon, evening. They took over actually salt grass steakhouse right by the marriott marquis because it's being hosted at the Mar marriott marquis so the salt grass steakhouse right outside of it was rented out by a kosher caterer the place was koshered the entire salt house salt salt grass what is it called salt yeah. grass steakhouse mm -hmm. was was uh koshered and i was actually sitting there in the lounge area in the front like you know and all of these fromies are all over the place. You know, it was, I, I knew a few people there, so I went to visit them, but it was a, an interesting experience. A lot of people there, a lot of people. Wow. Okay, okay so we're going to have our official designated Astros uh, scorekeeper who is going to tell us exactly uh, what the score is as it happens. Ed, that's your job. I was looking at Virginia election results. Oh, Virginia, how's it going? Well, it's early, but um, Youngkin's way ahead. It's too early. Yeah, yeah. it is probably enough room to. Uh, okay. So, um, either way, so we're going to have updated scores throughout the evening. Yes. So, worry not, my okay. dear friends. Worry <laughs> not. Okay. If if someone hits a home run, like Altuve uh, uh, does a leadoff home run, 
you can just pick up your hands and I'll know, but don't don't announce in the middle because this is all being recorded on our uh, podcast and then I have to uh, Oh my, okay. So hopefully, uh, here we go, one second. So so someone from our class can't make it, they're sick. Uh, Susan was supposed to go out of town tomorrow. Yeah, Susan's birthday today. Right, so she's supposed to go. And she said that she's sick in bed now. That's why she's at class, not because she's and they had to cancel their trip because she's not feeling well. Okay, so Rafur Shalema to Susan. And when she joins us, we'll mention that as well. Okay, we're ready to begin. Everyone ready? Everyone excited? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So we are up to we can begin here. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Living Jewishly podcast. We're coming to you live from Houston, Texas. We are up to Simon Bays, Seif Bays, the second halacha in the second chapter of the abridged code of Jewish law, known as the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. So we begin as follows. Yalbish Malbush Harishon. The first garment that one should put on should be Esatalis Katan for a man, their talus katan, which is their tzitzis, okay, which is the ones I'm wearing right here. As we know, there's a mitzvah in the Torah that any four-cornered garment should have these special fringes, these special tzitzis on them. And they, now, obviously, the biblical obligation is only when you're wearing a four-cornered garment. But we, because we love the mitzvahs of the Torah, we have a special four-cornered garment that we wear, not only a talit that's the big the prayer shawl that we wear in synagogue and when we pray, but also a special tzitzit that we wear, a four-cornered, it's like, like a shirt that we wear under our shirt. Most people wear it under. If you've seen the Hasidic uh, people walking around in, in Brooklyn or Williamsburg, you might see them with the black stripes on the tzitzis, right? You might see that. And that's because they're wearing wool tzitzis. It gets pretty hot in the summer. Either way, that's the first thing that a person should wear when they get dressed in the morning. So as not to walk four amas without wearing tzitzis. We said four amas is about eight feet. However, since putting on the tzitzis prior to washing hands in the morning, which is netilat yadayim, so he hasn't done that yet. And therefore, his hands are not yet clean. So he should not recite the blessing for tzitzis at that time. Okay? Clear? Everyone understand? We got it? Okay, great. Halacha number three says as follows. Halacha number three. Netila sedaim shachas hu The procedure. Okay, so take note here. The procedure for the morning netila sedaim, washing our hands in the morning, is as follows. No He takes the utensil filled with water in his right hand, and transfers it to his left hand. And then he pours water first on his right hand, and then he takes the, the utensil, the cup, the washing cup, filled with water with his right hand, and pours it onto his left hand. And he does this three times. So again, so you fill up the water basin, all right, the, the water pitcher. You lift it up with your right hand because you always do a mitzvah with the right hand. You always do a mitzvah with the right hand. So for example, uh, when someone walks through a doorway, many people have the custom, and we'll see this later, to kiss the mezuzah. Right? You kiss using your right hand. Why the right hand is always the hand we do uh, our mitzvahs, we perform mitzvahs with our right hand because the right hand is the hand of kindness. It's the hand, hand of mercy. It's the hand of mercy. And what we try to do is infuse all of the mitzvahs that we do with that kindness and that mercy. The left hand is the hand of judgment. 
and we're trying to stay away from judgment. Okay, so you got it. We take so we take the mitzvah with the right hand, but we have to wash our right hand first as well. So we pick it up with the right hand, pass it to the left hand. We wash the right hand, the left hand, and we do that three times. The right hand, the left hand, the right hand, the left hand. That's the proper way to wash your hands in the morning for cleanliness. For okay, Like we mentioned previously in Allah, the reason we wash our hands is because there is a spirit of impurity that comes onto our hands while we sleep. So that's what we're washing away. It go, it leaves our entire body except for our fingers. V'tov litlam ad perak and it is proper to wash the hands until the wrist. Ach bishasatch. However, in a pressing situation, if there isn't a lot of water, person, you know, back then you needed to have someone carry water for you. You'd have the water carries right. So you, you had a very limited amount of water in those situations. Dai ad It is sufficient to wash hands until the knuckles that join the fingers to the palm of the hand. So if you have enough water, wash till your wrist. And if you don't have enough water, wash till your knuckles. Okay? Shenemar. Okay. V'rochetz panav l'chvod yotzer. The Kitzur Shulchan Aruch continues here and says, V'rochetz panav l'chvod yotzer. And one should wash his face in the morning in honor of his creator. Shinemar is the first states. This is a verse in Genesis 9, verse 6. Elohim es ha'adam. In the form of God, he made man. And this is, you know, our face is holy. Actually, in a, a different halacha that I was learning uh, this week, we're not allowed to make an image of a person. That, actually, sorry, it's the Talmud that I learned today in the Daf Yomi. It talks about one of the great... Tanaic sages, you know, how do they know when a new month began? We know because we have a set calendar now, but it used to not be like that. So how did people know when Rosh Chodesh was, when Pesach was, when Sukkot and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur was? How did they know? So it would go by the moon and they would look. And as soon as someone would see the crescent of the brand new moon, they would run to the Bet Din and they would give testimony exactly what they saw where they saw how they saw how 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 you know, all the details what direction it was it was angled towards or away from every all of those details and as soon as it was verified and they had two witnesses who saw it saw it then they would declare that that day is Rosh Chodesh is the first day of the month and now they know how to calculate the 15th day of the month or the 14th day of the month whatever holiday was during that year during that month that's the way they would know. How would they pass the word around? So they would go to the nearest mountain in Houston that would work. But in Jerusalem, it worked very well because you have a bunch of hills and mountains. So they would go to the top of a hill and they would light up a, a like a cedar tree or something, or a branch, and they would wave it back and forth while it was lit on fire at night. Right. And then the next mountain, oh, they'd see, oh, look, there, there's the shame. That means it's Rosh Chodesh. We have to let the next mountain know. And they would light it up a branch as well. And then the next mountain until the entire land of Israel, all the way to Syria, everybody would know that it was Rosh Chodesh because they'd see these, these fires burning. Okay. So now, how did they know? How, yes. So what would happen if Rosh Chodesh comes in Shabbat? So there's actually, the Talmud talks about that. Great. Um, it's a great question. Uh, what would we do if it was on Shabbat? So actually for this, it was it was permitted for them to desecrate the Shabbat for the declaration of Rosh Chodesh. Right? So, but it's a great question. We can study the Talmud Rosh Hashanah, which talks about this in great detail. Um page 22, 23, and 24 of Tractate Rosh Hashanah. Uh, so, oh, so how did we get to this? So one of the great sages, it says in today's da- daf 23, it says that he had a graph that people of different images, how did you see the moon? Like this? Did you see it like that? Did you see it like this? That, like that? Exactly the positioning of the moon. 
and that's how it would be it would be asked and and each one would be able to say yes that's indeed how i saw the moon i saw it like this and i saw it like that so our sages asked how can you draw an image of the of the moon you're, it says that you're not allowed to draw an image of something which can be used for idolatry so Talmud goes into a long discussion about that, about p- drawing a picture of the sun, the moon, or so on and so forth. And the conclusion of the Talmud is, is that the only image that should not be drawn or made a, a, a monument of, or made, made a, a, like if you, uh, what do they call those statues, right? So a statue of a human being is the only statue that shouldn't be made. Why? Because the image of man is like the image of God. From this verse that we just mentioned now, the Talmud teaches us that the image of man is a reflection of God's image. And you can't make an image of God. Right? And that's why. So it's in when we're washing our face, what we're doing is we're washing our godliness. Okay? We're just cleaning that godliness, which is that God made us in his image. In it, right? In the form of God, he made man. He should also rinse out his mouth because of the, the stale saliva that builds up inside it overnight. This is before uh, uh, Listerine and before Colgate and Crest, right? This is before all of that. Our sages of blessed memory talked about rinsing our mouths every morning. Why? Not only so it should be fresh breath, but also so that it should clean away the stale saliva. Shetzorich lahaskir Hashem hagadol b'kedusha tahara. And since one must utter the name of Hashem with holiness and purity, ve'acharkach min nagev yadav. Afterward, he should dry his hands. Ve'izor le'nagev panav yafe. Then he should uh, wash his face, and he should be very careful to dry it really well. Why? Ask your dermatologist. Your dermatologist will tell you that if you don't dry your face really well, it will hurt your skin. Right? It won't be good for your skin. Um, leaving the the Orachim says, leaving one's face wet is not healthy for the skin. So if you thought you needed to go to a dermatologist, no, uh, uh, you needed to learn kits of shochan aruch. In fact, when we get to chapter thirty-two, uh, which will hopefully be at sometime this year. Chapter 32 has an entire, the entire chapter talks about the health and what we should eat and how we should protect our body. It's an amazing chapter. We'll get to it, God willing. Okay. So halacha number four, Seif four, says, Tzorich lito yodav davka v'soch kli. One must wash his hands. Now, what are we washing when we wash in the morning? We're washing away that impure spirit right the spirit of impurity so where do you wash that water to not on the floor right you don't want to wash that on the floor people are going to step on it now that impure spirit is on on their shoes and then they track it all over that no no, no. that's not where we wash right where do we wash it to only into a basin okay today that can be considered a sink as well okay it is forbidden to benefit from the water used for washing. For the spirit of impurity rests on these waters. And for this reason, when discarding the water, one should pour it out in a place where people do not walk. Don't pour it on your walkway. Right? Don't even use it for your flowers or plants because it's going to kill them. You have the spirit of impurity in this water after you wash it, right? So it's best for it not to be used for anything beneficial. Flush it down the drain. Okay, and that's the best way to dispose of netilat yadayim water from the morning. Halacha number five. Lo yiga kodem netila. So now, again, before we wash our hands, what's the state of our fingers? Impure. So should we touch our eyes? Should we touch our nose, our mouth, ears? 
We'll see that in Halacha right now. He's going to say, prior to washing one's hands, lo yiga kodem netila, in the morning one should refrain from touching any orifice of the body, lo bapeh, thus he should not touch his mouth, lo bachotem, and not in his nostrils, lo bainayim, and not in his eyes, lo bainayim, and not in his ears, nor is rectum, nor should he touch food, nor the puncture wound f- uh, from a bloodletting, meaning if a person was donating blood, it used to be they did bloodletting for health. They used to do that to, to, help, to heal people, right? Same thing, you shouldn't touch that area of where the, where the blood was drawn from. Because the, the, the spirit of impurity rests on the hands, before washing them. And mazik lidvarim ela and could cause terrible harm to these things, whether that be our our uh, our our nose or our eyes or our mouth or our ears or any other part of our body, any of the other openings of our body. Number six, halacha number six. Six. Any questions so far? No. Tov lahakbid benitilas yadaim shachas. It is proper to be scrupulous. When washing the morning, netilas yadayim, washing our hands in the morning. Bichli, with regard to the laws pertaining to the utensil that is used, ubamayim, with regard to the amount of the t- uh, and type of water used, ubekach gavra, and that the water should be poured from um, human force, meaning not to just put hands under a running faucet or put it into a stream, unless you don't have a vessel. If you don't have a vessel from which you pour it from, then there's obviously you have no choice. What are you going to do? Similar to the laws of washing your hands for a meal. However, in pressing circumstances, if he does not have the appropriate uh, conditions for water, who wrote to this bowel and he wishes to pray, then he may use, he may wash his hands with water from any utensil. And with any type of water, and without human force. And he may recite the blessing of Al Natilat Yadaim regarding washing the hands upon this washing. The Im and if there's a river or a brook in front of him nearby. It is better that he dip his hands into the river three times, or even into the snow. Again, this is where he does not have a vessel from which to pour the water onto his hands. So what are you going to do, right? So then you can then you can use the river or the snow and dip them in three times. Avol, im mayim kal. What's if someone doesn't have water altogether? No water. He's in a cabin in the middle of the forest. There is zero water. He should wipe his hands with something, right, like a dry cloth. And he should recite the blessing of Al-Nikil Sidaim regarding the cleanliness of the hands. Instead of using blessing, the blessing of Al-Nitilat Yadaim, which is on the washing of the hands, but rather Al-Nikil Yadaim, on the cleanliness of the hands. And this should be sufficient regarding the requirement of washing for prayer, but not sufficient to remove the spirit of impurity. And later, when water and suitable utensils become available to him, he should then rewash his hands and in the proper manner, but he should not recite anything else. Okay? He should not... Meaning, sorry, uh, uh, one second. Aval lo yivarech od. He should not recite another blessing. Okay, that concludes the sixth seif. Yes. Does this need to be done in a sink that's not in the bathroom so that you can recite the the bracha? So, right. So the I'm going to tell you now the halacha. The halacha is that any what is a bathroom? A bathroom is a a place that is used only for a bathroom as soon as it has another purpose like a sink like a shower right well a shower 
can get the same category of, of as a bathroom because it's a, like a bath house. That's what, right? But if it has a sink in there, then you can't. Then then it already removes the title of being a bathroom. Okay, in Israel they have many. In in most bathrooms they make in Israel, you wonder they have a little faucet near the floor. And they usually use that, make that faucet there so that they can fill up the basin with water because that's how they clean the floors. They do something called sponja, right? Sponja is how they clean the floors in Israel. They pour water on the floor and they mop it around and then they throw the water off the porch. If you walk on Friday afternoon in many of the streets in Jerusalem, you, you're at risk on Friday afternoon because that's when they... All the houses, they wash their floors for Shabbos. And if you under one of those porches, one of those decks, right, you might get the, all that splash of water right on your head, right? All of the dirty floor water on your head, right? That's not always the case. Many people are careful not to do that because they know people walking below. But um, what's the idea? The idea is, is that um, when they fill up those basins, they have a little faucet on the... In, in the bathroom, right? And that already, that alone makes it not be an exclusive bathroom. What is today an exclusive bathroom? Uh, a porta potty. A porta potty has no other purpose than being a bathroom. And it doesn't get cleaned. Meaning, of course, they clean it. But while it's there at the construction site or wherever it's at, right? It has an awful smell. If anybody's ever used one, you know what I'm talking about. It's an awful smell. It smells almost like a Ukrainian bathroom, right? And it's it's terrible. It really is terrible. So you know you know what a Ukrainian bathroom is. I'm sorry to this like a, it's probably not as bad as the Korean bathroom. Uh, it probably is. Basically, they make a ditch. They make a ditch in the ground, and then they put cement on top of a cement block on top of it with a few holes. Okay, and I'm I'm just telling you the way it is. Okay. Sorry, this is not respectful for our podcast audience. I'm going to have to cut this out. But either way, so uh, worse than an outhouse. Anna, this is a lot worse than an outhouse, okay? And basically, that's how they use the facilities into those those holes. And they're like the size of a, of, of a toilet, I guess. But it's all there. It's not, okay, it's, it's, it smells awful. I mean, you can't clear yourself from that smell. For a while, it's terrible. It's it's terrible. Either way, you cannot make a blessing there. That's a bathroom. Today, the bathrooms that we have, for most part, are really clean. Hopefully, they're really clean. So it's not recommended to say a blessing there. It's not recommended to say a blessing there. But halakhically, if there's no other option for whatever reason, it's clean enough. And if there's another purpose there, as in having a sink, halakhically, it would be okay to say a blessing. Does that answer your question, Aliza? Yes. So better to do it in like a kitchen. It's always better to do it in the kitchen or many times you have like a sink room before the bathroom. Right. In Houston, I know many of the houses have that, right? So that's the best. That way you can wash over there. You don't have to wash all the way in the, in the kitchen, right? You can, the, the, the actual washroom, the, the the bathroom is its own room, and then you have outside is where you have the sink, and that's that's also water closet, right? Uh, that's also very good for one to use that, but not to wash in the actual restroom room. Thank you. Right now, if you do wash there, which could be okay, don't say the blessing there. Okay. Now, halacha number seven. Oh, one more time. Okay, great. Halacha number seven. Ksiv, it is written. Borchi nafshi, nafshi es Hashem v'chol kravai Hashem kocho. Bless Hashem, O my soul, and let all of my innermost blessed being bless His holy name. V'chein, v'kevon, shetzari cha'adam. V'kevon, shetzari cha'adam levarich. Es Hashem v'chol kravav, since a person must bless Hashem. With the participation of all his inner organs, also It is therefore forbidden for one to recite a blessing until he has cleansed his inner organs. Mitzoa from excrement and urine. 
in the morning when he arises, one usually must attend to his needs and defecate in the morning, or at least to urinate. Al Cain, therefore, Lo Yivarech Birchas Al Antiel Sedaim Bishas Natila Ad La Achas Shinakes Atzma of Yirchatz Yad of Od Pam Achas. He should not recite the blessing of Al Natilat Yadaim at the time that he washed his, washes his hands until after he has cleansed himself, after relieving himself, right? And then he should re- wash his hands a second time. So again, you wake up, you say Modani, you. Wash your hands. You go to the restroom and you wash your hands again, and then you say the blessings. Okay. Now, if a person doesn't have the ability to wait and wash their hands, then a person can just go straight to the restroom and wash their hand one time after using the bathroom, and that would be for both using the restroom and for cleaning their hand from the spirit of impurity. And then he says the blessing of Alam Tiyat Yadayim, the Ashayatzar, and the blessing of Ashayatzar, and then of course recites Birchas Torah, the blessing over the study of Torah, the Birchas Elokai Neshama, and the blessing of Elokai, my God, Neshama, the soul that you have restored within me. Anyone finding this interesting? Yes? Sounds good? I didn't see any hands up. There's a score? Oh, 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 oh no score! Oh, oh, it's zero. Oh, it was a score that that we love this, and we're learning a lot. Are we, Pascal? We're we're learning a lot. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Great. Too many bathroom details, though. Right, but you know what? We're gonna get through it once, and that's it. We'll flush it out. <laughs> Touche. There you go. I saw that, Anna. But dumb. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have one, two more halachas, and then we'll stop. We'll finish this simon. We have learned above, Seif 1, that the requirement to wash one's hand upon awakening was enacted as an inauguration to the day's service of Hashem, as a Kohen washes his hand prior to the service in the temple. This is the, the reason offered by Rashba, Rash, however, oh, uh, by the Rashba. This is the reason offered by the Rashba. Rush, however, offers a different reason for this requirement. When a person sleeps, his hand moves about and inevitably touches parts of the body that are unclean. In his view, the sages enacted the morning Natilas Yadaim to ensure that one would have clean hands for prayer. The halacha recognizes both the reason of the Rashba and the Rush, both of those reasons, because of the spirit of impurity and because of wandering hands. Thus, the blessing of the Tiyos Yadayim is recited only when both, reason, when both reasons of washing apply. In addition, as we discussed earlier, as we have learned, there is also an obligation to wash your hands so as to remove the... spirit of impurity from them. However, the reason, this reason alone does not warrant the recitation of the blessing. The Seif discusses four situations in which one is required to wash his hands, but for the reason outlined above, does not recite the blessing of al Natil Sedaim. Okay, so now you ready? Im hishkim v'natal yadav ba'od If one awake in the middle of the night and washed his hands, kedino, as the halacha tells us, er ad and then remained awake until daybreak. So he woke up at four o'clock in the morning, washed his hands, tried to go back to sleep, couldn't fall back asleep, stayed up. Or if after awakening and washing his hands, he returned to sleep a second time while it was still night. Likewise, one who slept during the day for about 60 breaths, which is our sages tell us, 30 minutes, Shuhu Erechatisho, which is approximately a half hour, Vechen Anir Kalalailo, Velo Yashan Shisinishmin. Likewise, one who remained awake the entire night and did not sleep for at least a half hour. Vechol Elu Yesh Safikim Tsurchin Etios Yadaim Alo. 
In all of these cases, there is a question whether or not he must wash his hands or not. Lachain, therefore, yitol yadav shalosh param besirugin. Therefore, he should do the same procedure of washing his hands three times in an alternating way. But he should not recite the blessing after washing. Okay? So that is a very interesting halacha because it's not clear as to his obligation to wash his hands. So therefore, you don't say a blessing for it. You wash, but you don't say a blessing. This if, this if contains the list of activities that render the hands unclean. And thus, a person engaging in these activities must clean his hands before studying Torah or praying. In addition, most of these activities also cause a ruach ra to rest upon the hands, which is the spirit of impurity. And therefore, they must be washed without delay to remove it. Okay, so now we're going to list a bunch of things that need washing of the hands after performing them. Okay, ready? These performing any of the following activities requires one who engages in them to wash his hands with water. One who arises from his bed, like we said in the morning, right? One who leaves the lavatory or the bathhouse. So you go take a shower, you wash your hands when you're done. You go to the bathroom, you wash your hands when you're done. Someone who cuts their nails. Someone who cuts his hair. Someone takes off his shoes, leather shoes, if you're touching it with your own hand. If you use a one of those shoe horns, that's fine. If you're able to slip your foot in without touching your shoe, like I just did, right? then you don't need to wash your hands. However, if you touch the shoe, then you have to. One who engages in marital relations. One who touches a... Uh, a uh, a, a louse or a knit or someone who delouses a garment right? they spray off their garment uh, even if he did not touch a, a any of the knits one who scratches his head or one touches his body in places that are usually covered Someone who leaves a cemetery, one who attends a funeral or enters a covered space, a covered area in which there is a dead person. If you're in the same room, same building of a dead person, of, of, of a corpse. And one who has undergone a bloodletting. All of these need washing of the hands after concluding these activities. Okay. So, and that concludes, my dear friends, that concludes Simon Bayes, the second Simon of the Kitsa Shochan Aruch. Congratulations to everyone. And um, that's great. So now we know how to wash our hands. We know all, everything that's required and all the same laws of how to wash our hands. We pick it up with the right hand, pass it to the left hand, wash on the right, on the left, on the right, on the left, on the right, on the left, and you're good to go. And that's after any of those activities, like we said, cutting our nails, getting a haircut, shaving, all of those are included in the uh, activities that require washing our hands. Of course, going to the bathroom, taking a shower, where we have to wash away our, um, wash our hands to keep them clean. And it's amazing that in this uh, COVID-19 era, it really is amazing that you have such an extraordinary focus on cleanliness. They say, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Well, that's what the halacha tells us. The halacha tells us, you know, what? What? one of the uh, medical illnesses that transfer are under the nails. You know that? Under the nails is a very dirty place. In our, so when we cut our nails, what are we doing? Taking out all the dirt, right? So your hands are involved with all of that dirt. Yeah. Wash your hands. Yeah. We don't need the CDC to tell us this, right? This is—it's an amazing thing. The, the wisdom that our sages are imparting with us already, thousands of years. We're seeing today is like, wow! Oh, look, they—they they knew what they were talking about. Okay, thank you, my dear friends. Living Jewishly concludes. Now we're going to resume with the Chumash class in four minutes. Anybody who wants to drink something, eat something, go do that now. I'm going to send an email very, very 
Well, you know, I'll do that right now. Quick question, Rabbi Robbie. Go for it. So you're out getting a haircut. You don't have a washing vessel with you. Is there portable washing vessels or are you just improvise or what? You can use a cup, any cup. Okay. You can use a, a yeah, any type of cup is fine. Just give me a second here. I want to it send. A cup. I hear. Oh, very good. He says, make sure it's a Yiddish cup. All right, Yiddish uh, cup. A cup is a brain, right? The Yiddish cup is. Okay, so I'm going to make sure I have everyone's email address. I'm sending you the PDF. So I have Pascal. I have Elisa. I'm going to wash my hands. Excuse me. Sure, 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 sure. And Anna, woman of stone. There you go. Thank you. And this is Toldos. And I'm just going to get the notes from the other. Okay, everybody, I'll see you in one minute. One second, I'm not turning this off. I'm just stopping the recording.